everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan, and today is part six of the Lighting for Photography series. Today we're talking about the only light that was invented specifically for photography, flash. last video you probably heard me make reference to the fact I've only ever delivered one baby. Well that baby was born 28 years ago today and her name is Nicola and she's my youngest daughter and this episode is for her. She doesn't watch the uh, videos so she won't ever know about it but it is for her anyway. And uh, not only did I deliver her 28 years ago but I was born myself 34 years before that, also today. So it's a happy day, a double birthday. Let's talk about flash. Unsurprisingly, flash is a very big subject. I've decided to cover this in two videos. In the first video, we're gonna talk about the history of flash, the science of flash, the difference between speed lights and studio lights. Then we're gonna get into the confusing subject of flash power. In the second video, we're gonna look at flash duration, TTL versus manual, how we synchronize flash with our cameras. We'll look at macro, modifiers, a few tips on how to use flash, and some on how to buy flash. Before we get started, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, as always. I couldn't be doing this if it were not for you, and that also includes you find people who have made a, a generous contribution through the website. The links for that type of thing are down below. If you want more information about the equipment that we talk about today, you can find that in my blog post, and uh, I will put a link to my blog in the show notes below. So what exactly is flash? Well, it's kind of obvious, a bright flash of light that allows us to do three things. It allows us to put light in dark places, it allows us to freeze motion, and it allows us to control contrast. And it does all of those things without burning us to death. But flash was not always like that. Let me explain. Flash is the only source of light that we have talked about in this entire series that was created specifically for photography. Now it's used for other things like uh, it's used for pumping power uh, into lasers uh, to get them all excited. Uh, but uh, outside of science, uh, it's really only used by consumers in photography. Now, the first mention of anything even like flash uh, was way back in 1839 when some French dudes were digging up fossils in a cave and wanted to take pictures of them. Flash hadn't been invented and wouldn't be invented for uh, almost a hundred years, but what they did was they lit the scene uh, using limelight. Limelight was the same thing that they used to burn down theatres. <laughs> uh, in Europe, the idea was that you would use a hot flame to get a substance called quicklime, which is calcium oxide, really, really hot. And when it got to a certain temperature, it would, it would give off this very uh, high intensity white light. Of course, that's a very dangerous way to do things, but that's how they took this first set of daguerreotypes of the fossils. Uh, and over the next 50 years, people came up with new and exciting ways to set themselves on fire using limelight and uh, magnesium. Magnesium, it turns out, is something that if you set fire to it, it kind of explodes in a white ball of light and fire. Over the course of the next 50 years, magnesium, uh, which had been discovered to be a great source of bright white light when you set fire to it, uh, had been experimented with fairly extensively, but it was incredibly expensive because it was so hard to get out of the ground. Uh, but over that next 50 years, uh, a lot of processes were improved and eventually the price of magnesium came way down until in 1887, a couple of German guys, uh, Adolf Mieter and Johannes Geddeck, invented this amazing powdery substance called Blitzlichtpuller which is like lightning flash explosive. 
powder, something like that. And they made this stuff into sheets and into powders. They even stuffed explosive tea bags with the with the material. I'm sure you've seen pictures of people with a little tray of uh, Blitzlich Pula getting set on fire so they can take a photograph. So they were responsible probably for quite a few immolations as well, but it really made a big difference. It was much better than any of the, the limelight uh, options ever had been before. And it really started to catch on, but not in a huge way because of the fact that, you know, half the people who used it burned to death. So that held people back. So this Blitzlichtpula was uh, a, a really cool substance. It was made of powdered magnesium mixed with potassium chromate. And uh, when ignited, it gave off a really bright flash of light. But as time went by, new ideas were uh, invented uh, all along the way. And most of them involved the use of magnesium. Uh, magnesium was being made into really thin ribbons that were easy to uh, set fire to. Uh, usually a length of, of ribbon would be cut to give the desired amount of brightness and that would be ignited to take the picture. But the really big breakthrough back in those days came when it was figured out that you could enclose that magnesium in a glass envelope uh, and ignite it electronically or mechanically. There were, there were different ways that, that it could be ignited, but it could be held in a, a bulb, hopefully to prevent the fire getting into your ears and into your hair. So even though flash was now a little less dangerous and a little bit more um, available, it still wasn't really popular. People didn't like flash. It had a kind of a bad rep. It was terrifying. And people didn't want to have their photographs taken with this you know, flaming photographer standing in front of them. The occasional use of flash uh, may have just kind of languished on in America, were it not for one very interesting period of time. It, happened during the uh, Great Depression in the 1930s when uh, the American government formed a thing called the Farm Security Administration. And the uh, FSA hired 11 photographers, including the now very famous Dorothea Lang, uh, who were given cameras and flash equipment and went out to document the uh, the the terrible conditions across the country during the Great Depression. And their photographs are, in so many ways, iconic. Dorothea Lang, by the way, was the lady who uh, took the photograph migrant mother that uh, I'm sure everybody on the planet has seen. These are some wonderful photographs. And they were able to photograph in places that really were inaccessible for photography before this time because of flashbulbs. Flashbulbs were very quickly adopted by people using cameras as tools, uh, especially police photographers, crime scene photographers, press photographers, who were working at night, working in shady parts of big cities and needed some kind of portable light source. So these flashbulbs were uh, in great demand by press photographers uh, in the 30s and 40s. In a way, though, it cemented the negative feelings that the public had towards flash photography, something that wasn't helped in the following decades by uh, the, the growth of the paparazzi. But it still was, uh, it still was a, a form of light that yielded kind of stark, harsh photographs, usually of uh, places and situations that, that struck fear into people's hearts. Uh, so the only flash photography that you were likely to see was in the newspaper and it probably had a dead body in it. So uh, flash, uh, again, was not catching on with, with uh, regular photographers until things changed with the flash bulbs. And they went from being uh, gigantic uh, uh, globes that were very expensive and uh, required heavy equipment to use uh, 
to the types of flash bulbs that became popular in the 50s and 60s. These were the tiny little flash bulbs that you've seen, uh, either assembled in cubes so that you would have four flashes for every cube, or sometimes in strips. If you remember the flip strip that used to have uh, 10 or a dozen flash bulbs in a row, and you'd take six pictures and flip it over and take another six. Uh, what made those so user-friendly for people was that they didn't have to change the flash bulbs uh, that often. And the, uh, the bulbs had a new coating. Um, they, if you remember, they had a bluish look. That was because a plastic coating was put on the outside of them that stopped the bulbs from occasionally exploding. It kind of held the glass together uh, when they would otherwise have exploded. And it also... Um, added um, a, a bluish cast to the photograph. And if you look back at any flash photographs from back in those days, uh, they all have a very, uh, a very typical flash look. And that was because of, of these inexpensive flash bulbs. But it was work that was being done in the late 50s and early 60s by a real pioneer of uh, flash, a guy named Harold Edgerton. Uh, he was working with high-speed flash, and I'm sure you've also seen his iconic photographs of bullets passing through apples or uh, decks of cards. Uh, he uh, pioneered the use of really high-speed flash photography. And indeed, uh, in 1931, he invented the first electronic flash device for photography. It was kind of big and uh, dangerous and heavy, and uh, they weren't made much use of until the 50s. In the 50s, people were starting to buy the slightly less expensive studio lights uh, that were electronic and built along much the same lines they are today. But these things were enormous. They ran off uh, multiple 12-volt lead-acid batteries um, and the equipment was just uh, daunting to use. And they were really, really expensive. Uh, so they weren't used that much. But of course, as happens over the 70 years that followed, the science both of, of the flash device as well as cameras and computers just moved ahead by leaps and bounds. But the big shift from flash bulbs to electronic flash happened uh, a good 40 years after Harold invented the first electronic flash. And that was when smaller, more compact flashes, still mostly used in the studio and still very expensive, but they became uh, more affordable to operate and to use than buying an endless stream of flash bulbs. Allow me a brief anecdote. When I was 13, I had come across a book all about a German physicist, chemist named uh, uh, Robert Bunsen. Robert Bunsen was the guy that invented the Bunsen burner, and his scientific experiments all consisted of setting fire to things. And somewhere in there, I read about the amazing uh, characteristics of magnesium as it burns. And I, I don't know where I heard this, but uh, somebody must have told me that pencil sharpeners back in those days were, they, they look like they're made of uh, aluminium, but they're very light and they have a steel blade screwed into them, but they're metal and you'd put your pencil in and twist it. They look the same now, but believe me, they aren't, because these things were made of a magnesium alloy back then. And I put one of those things on a, a, a stand, a Bunsen burner stand, and put a Bunsen burner under it. And I put the, the flame up high to see what would happen to the pencil sharpener. Well, it caught fire, and it burned right through the desk in the chemistry lab that I was sitting at. And it caused a fair amount of uproar at the school, I can tell you. And uh, you couldn't put it out. Uh, they tried putting it out with buckets of water and all kinds of things. It just kept burning, burned a hole in, through the desk and a big divot in the floor underneath. 
That was fun. Those days were fun. <laughs> I got in so much trouble. So what is an electronic flash itself? Well, at their heart, they all have the same DNA. Whether it's a pop-up flash on a, a camera, a speed light, or a, a big studio light, they all operate the same way. They have two key components, and it's much, much more complicated than this, but basically, they have a capacitor, which is an electronic component capable of storing charge, a large amount of, of charge, and is also capable of releasing that very quickly into a circuit. Now, the second component is what's called the flash tube, which is usually a quartz glass tube filled with xenon gas, which is a noble gas, and it has electrodes at one end and the other. And those two electrodes are connected to the capacitor. Now, normally, there's a huge gap between the electrodes, and the capacitor is not going to be able to, to discharge across that gap. So what has to happen is the xenon in the quartz tube has to form ions. It has to be ionized. Once it's ionized, all of a sudden, the current can pass between the electrodes. And it does so blindingly fast. And it, I think the charge travels at uh, 640 miles per second as it discharges across the tube. Now, a device like this has a, a big fat tube about four inches long. Uh, the device inside the camera has a, about a centimeter long tube uh, and everything in between, but the idea is the same. Now, the larger uh, flash tubes usually require a, 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 an initiation event to happen. They need something to ionize the, the um, xenon in the tube. So they have a secondary circuit that provides a short burst of really high voltage, much higher than the flash itself, somewhere between 20,000 volts and 150,000 volts that will cause a localized ionization of the xenon. If you look at a flash tube, you'll see that there is a wire that attaches usually to a metal ring at one end of the, the flash tube, but not the electrodes. It's away from the electrodes. And that is where the current uh, passes, this massive initiation or triggering current. And it causes a little blob of ionization right at that spot. And then the ionization spreads down the glass. There's usually a piece of metal ribbon or a wire wrapped around it to help this happen. But what happens is it forms dendrites, which are fingers of ionized xenon that spread down the tube very, very fast. I mean, that's what happens in the blink of an eye. And when those dendrites hit the cathode, all of a sudden, you now have a conduction pathway through the flash tube, and the capacitor will instantly drain all of its stored current right through it. Now, even though the capacitors may only be 330 microfarads, most usually they are, and they may only hold about 330 volts, the way the, the capacitor is designed, the current density of the, the, the shock that it delivers either to the flash tube or to you, <laughs> if you short it out with yourself, uh, is enough to kill you, absolutely kill you. In fact, one of, the, one of the ways people get hurt or killed by messing around with, with uh, uh, speed lights, for example, is they'll have the thing opened up and they'll get a shock from the, from the triggering circuitry, which is enough to give you a bad fright and uh, a nasty shock. It's not enough to kill you. But when you spasm and, and freak out with the first shock is when you inadvertently touch your screwdriver to the real problem, the capacitor. 
and then you die. So, <laughs> so they're really dangerous. Don't open one. Don't open one. It's not worth it. I'm going to. Uh, I might even do a video of it because um, uh, one of my one of my Godoxes is broken, and I'm going to try to replace the flash tube in it. But anyway, that's that's uh, uh, another matter. So you may be wondering. What kind of color spectrum does a flash tube give off its light in? Because as we talked about, light is just energy and it exists in, in all these different wavelengths across the visible spectrum and down into infrared and up into ultraviolet. And all of the light sources we've talked about have a representative uh, uh, spectrum showing the wavelengths of the light that's produced. Well. The wavelengths of light that are produced in a flash tube, a xenon flash tube, are entirely dependent and uh, very closely tied to the current in the tube. So the way the, the energy in the flash tube is measured is using something called current density. Current density is the number of amps within a square centimeter uh, of space. And at high current densities of like 400 amps uh, per uh, square centimeter, the flash tubes give off an incredibly even full spectrum light. Actually, it's more than full spectrum visible light because there's a lot of ultraviolet in it as well. I'll get to that in just a second. So in order to get a nice white daylight balanced light with a full spectrum of wavelengths, you really need to have high cur current density, which is why we have these dangerous capacitors <laughs> pumping all of that power through the tube. Because if we didn't, we'd end up with light that's mostly at the lower energy end of the spectrum, reds and, uh, and, and infrared even, as opposed to the full spectrum that we need. I used to think that current density was how many of those horrible little black, sweet, dried things they put in Christmas puddings. Uh, I hate currents, and if the current density of the Christmas pudding was above like two, I didn't want it. Too much information, right? Okay, so that's how the flash works, and that's the light that's given off. Just about every flash that you will buy today also has special coatings on the glass that are extremely effective at blocking uh, most of the ultraviolet spectrum. They usually block down to about 380 nanometers. Uh, so that's, that's important because flashes that have been tinkered with or uh, have have lost their coatings for one reason or another, will put out enough ultraviolet light to blind you uh, and to give you a suntan. I'll be getting into a good bit more detail about flash synchronization in just a little bit, but one of the reasons that the electronic flash was so welcomed by photographers was the fact that the old flash bulbs would require a synchronization shutter speed of about one-tenth of a second up to about one-thirtieth. Electronic flash, because of the way these discharges occur, are incredibly quick, uh, down to one-ten-thousandth of a second or one-twenty-thousandth of a second. We'll get into that in, a, in just a minute. I said just a minute ago that at the core of any flash is this same combination of a capacitor and a flash tube. That is true. But as anybody who has shot with speed lights and studio lights know, they behave differently and uh, they need to be used differently. So what are the differences between these two? There are two different ways that you can vary the amount of power that the flash puts out. And it's based on how the capacitor is handled. So with a studio strobe, when you set the power to a lower number, what you are doing is restricting the uh, voltage that is held in the capacitor. 
so that when the capacitor discharges, it releases less energy. Now, you may wonder if that it does not cause a problem with either the spectrum or the color of the light. Well, actually it does, and it's one of the main drawbacks with cheaper studio lights is that uh, as you use lower and lower powers, the discharge time is, is not going to change that much. In fact, it can even go up, but the color can change, and it can, can change quite a bit. If the current is passing through with a lower voltage gradient, then it's not going to create the current density that you need for that full spectrum of white light and it will shift in colors and sometimes it's quite a lot. So in contrast to the studio strobes, speed lights and small camera flashes use solid state technology to, the, to vary the brightness, the intensity, the power of the flash. And they do that using a technology known as isolated gate bipolar transistor switching. That's a big mouthful of words that means that these devices control the rate at which the capacitor discharges, which is very different than controlling the amount of energy the capacitor stores. And that's the main difference between the two. It's why with a speed light, as you drop the power, you shorten the duration of the flash a lot. That does not happen the same way with studio lights. One area that inevitably causes confusion is when we're trying to describe the power or the intensity of a given flash. For speed lights and other small light lights, we use the guide number. And for studio lights, we normally talk about either watt seconds or joules. And for the sake of this argument, we'll say they're about the same. Now, let's look first at the speed lights. The guide number of any given speed light is a constant. It doesn't change. And that constant describes the relationship between the f-stop and the distance. So the formula you would use to derive the, the guide number is guide number equals distance times f-stop. It's that simple. That can also be expressed as distance equals guide number divided by f-stop. But the main reason the guide number exists is so that you can take two speed lights side by side and see that, ah, oh, this one has a guide number of 60 and this one has a guide number of 48. So the one with 60 is more powerful. But what's really cool about the guide number is using that little formula, we can plug numbers in and actually get some guidance on how to use the flash itself. Let's say we wanted to take a photograph with this flash, but we wanted for creative purposes to set the aperture on our camera at f4. Well, we know the guide number is 60 because that's a, a fixed constant. So 60, the guide number, equals distance, which we're trying to figure out. So that remains unknown, times 4. Another way to put that, like I said, is distance equals guide number 60 divided by 4. 60 divided by 4 is 15. So it tells you right there that 15 meters would be where you would want to position this flash to get a perfect exposure at full power and at ISO 100. And 15 meters is about 50 feet. So that's actually kind of useful. And you can use it also to, to uh, set the distance and come up with uh, the, the ideal aperture to shoot at. Uh, of course, in real life, what you'll do is you'll use it for a couple of days and you'll figure all this out intuitively that you'll know roughly what power you need to be. You know, in the days of film, I completely understand why we spent so much time with, with light meters and calculators figuring out how not to waste film, basically, to get the right shot the first time. In this day and age, it, it really seems hardly necessary because trial and error is so quick and painless with digital cameras that you can shoot a couple of test shots and pretty much right away come up with the, the light you want. So using the guide number to compare the, the power of two different speed lights, 
is a reasonable concept. Using the number of watt seconds on your studio lights to compare the light output is not. Let me explain why. Pretty much all speed light, all studio lights, whether they're monoblocks like this or whether they have a pack and a head configuration, they're going to tell you what the maximum power of that device is. But that actually has nothing to do or very little to do with what comes out of this. And that's key. Each different system with its different circuitry, its different light uh, flash bulb, will have a different efficiency in how it produces light. So we could have two flash units, each with a rating of 1000 watt seconds, and they could have drastically different illumination capability in actual use. And that's because of the relative efficiency of the device. There are so many ways that a device like this can lose efficiency if it's not well designed or well built. The components make a difference. The way it's put together makes a difference. The flash bulb, the gas inside, the coatings, all of this makes a difference. Not to mention the reflector you put on it. Uh, all of this will change how much light one of these things gives off. So the watt second rating is really a lot less helpful than it sounds. If you want to know exactly how much light a given studio light is putting off, just set it up in the studio where you're going to, uh, to set the light, put your subject where you're gonna put your subject and then use a light meter like this Siconic, which will fire the flashes for me and just pop the flashes and take a reading. It'll give a reading in an f-stop and that f-stop is telling you this is how wide open your aperture has to be to expose this shot perfectly at full power on the on the light so you can use a light meter to get a very good understanding of how much light your device gives off at full power and then you can make your calculations and set up your shots on the basis of that information but it's not very useful for uh, comparing devices because unlike the guide number, which actually does compare a, a, a set of parameters, the uh, studio lights don't give you that and the, the watt seconds can be misleading. What you definitely don't wanna do is make a decision on which studio light to buy based on the number of watt seconds it has stamped on the box. Older, and cheaper studio flashes will generally have a lot less light per watt second. But if you wanna know how much, you have to go to, to testing data and look and see what people have actually found. Let's talk for just a minute about the power increments on both the speed lights and the studio lights. So the way we describe the power output of a speed light is using fractions. One over one is full power. One over two is half that power. One over four is half again. One over eight, half again. So it's halvings going down, doublings going up. And it doesn't tell you anything about the intensity of the flash except as it relates to the levels above and below it. Bear in mind whether you're using speed lights or studio flashes, that the inverse square law uh, comes into play whenever you're moving lights closer or further away. Remember that every doubling or halving of the distance between the subject and the light is a multiplier of four in terms of the light intensity. In other words, if you move twice as far away, you have one fourth the amount of photons hitting your subject. And conversely, as you move half the distance towards the light, the light intensity is gonna go up by a factor of four. So that's important to bear in mind as you're, you're moving the lights around. Earlier, I briefly mentioned the different way that the power is handled by speed lights and by studio lights. That is tending to go away. Most of the really good studio lights these days are digital, which means they're using these isolated gate bipolar transistor switching systems to be able to accomplish 
the same kind of flexibility you get from a speed light. The older, cheaper uh, studio lights, the problem is usually that you can't get it dim enough. You can't dial the power back enough. That's something that you really need to have the IGBT technology to do. So modern speed lights will usually give you nine or 10 stops of, of, of light, meaning that there are 10 doublings before you run out of room. And like I said with the speed lights, if you spend an hour or two with whatever studio flashes you have and use a light meter to get a real feel for how much power they put out, that's all you'll ever have to do. It'll just click that you know, this is where you need to put the light to get the exposure you want at f2.8 or whatever. Uh, by having by having gone to the trouble to, to actually measure uh, the light intensity at each given setting, uh, you'll, you'll remember it. You don't have to do these calculations just to use flash. One last thing I'd mention about the difference between the speed lights and the studio lights is what is important when you're making a purchase decision? What numbers do you need to look at? Certainly for the speed light, I think it's valuable to look at the guide number. It's also important, I think, to look at the recycle time. It's also important to look at the flash duration, though on these IGBT switched systems, uh, your duration is gonna be probably everything you could ever need uh, especially at lower powers, so that's a bit less important. The other thing I look at is what kind of battery system it has. Can it be plugged into the wall? Uh, I, I have become a real fan of the uh, lithium iron packs that they put in these uh, new Godox flashes and a lot of other flashes. They just last forever. Uh, and whether or not the device zooms. That's kind of important too, because a lot of these newer flashes will actually allow you to narrow the beam of light to give you more reach. The stuff you need to look at when you're buying a studio light, uh, it's, it's a little more complicated. Um, and I'm not kidding when I say probably the most important number is the price. Look at the watt seconds because that will give you some ballpark idea of, you can assume that the more expensive lights are gonna be highly efficient. The more efficient the light is, the more meaningful the watt seconds are. The other crucial thing you need to look at when you're thinking about a studio light is how low can it go? So you want something that gives you a large number of stops. The better, newer, digital devices will let you get down to one 256th power. If you're planning on using studio lights in macro in the studio, I, I really strongly urge you to get uh, better lights, expensive lights that give you a nice, consistent, low power. Virtually all new flash has built-in Wi-Fi, so you're going to need to plan on getting an appropriate trigger to run all of your stuff. While everything that I've just said is pretty true and has been pretty true in the past, things are changing really fast. Speed lights are getting a lot more powerful and uh, the, the color consistency of the devices is improving all the time. Likewise, with uh, studio lights, they're getting a lot more sophisticated. They use, uh, they use almost exclusively digital technology now, so they're able to give both incredible color constancy as well as very short flash durations. So really, the two forms of flash are starting to grow towards one another. The three most desirable features in any flash unit is a good price, very fast durations and very good color constancy. They used to say that you could only have two of those. If you wanted color constancy and fast speed, you weren't gonna get a good price. They were expensive units. But that seems to be changing as uh, studio lights are adopting uh, digital technology. They're becoming a lot more like big, powerful speed lights and even speed lights are getting more and more powerful and becoming a lot more like small studio lights. So my hope is that one day in the near future, we'll be able to buy fantastic flash equipment with great color constancy, 
fantastic flash durations and all of that flexibility and a reasonable price. We're not there yet. I think that's enough for part one. I'll be back in a few days with part two where we will pick up where we left off, talking about flash duration, synchronization, TTL, macro, modifiers, a buying guide, and I'll sing a song or something to round it all out. So I'll be back in a few days with that. Thanks for joining me. I hope you found something useful in this video and I will see you soon. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye-bye.